Well, happy Wednesday evening to you all. Trust you had a great day. If you live in at least central Maine, it has been a gorgeous day. So I trust that you are feeling encouraged by the change in weather. And if you're not in central Maine, uh, rejoice with us because it's been a great day. Well, we're going to be in James chapter 2, starting in verse 14 to 26. As you turn to James chapter 2, I want to have a couple of prayer requests, and then we're going to jump into James chapter 2. Uh, I'm only going to share three. I've got a whole list, so I'd encourage you to look tomorrow on my Facebook page, look on the church's Facebook page, and uh, we're going to have a, a longer list, but I just have uh, three updates for you tonight. The first one is we've been praying for Leanne, who is Jesse Bro's niece, and she uh, was in Bangor with the COVID-19. She's now been transferred to Boston, and she's been on a ventilator for seven weeks. So the family is uh, asking for more prayer for Leanne as she is really struggling with this. Pray for the family during such difficult times. Uh, the second one is Juanita Robinson, who's been a, a long member and a sweet lady of our church. She's having trouble with her eyes with macular degeneration, and she has um, had received some bad news about her eyes, that there's not a whole lot that they can do. And so we're praying for her uh, and her spirit as she comprehends that uh, Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart faint. So we're, we're going to pray for her, and you pray for her as you remember her as well. And then I got a call from John Mary this morning, their oldest daughter, Amy, she's about eight. <clears throat> she was uh, involved in an accident in a, with a chainsaw, and the chainsaw hit her arm, and there are superficial wounds. And so she had to go to the ER. She is home, and she has about eight stitches on her left arm, and she's pretty sore, and it was uh, pretty scary. So John and the family asked that you pray for quick healing and also just pray that she would um, have a full recovery from this. So would you take just a few moments and pray with me tonight as uh, as you turn to James 2, just remember these three folks and then check back tomorrow for more. Lord, we thank you for an opportunity that we have to pause, to gather around our computer, whether it's uh, you're in Maine or somewhere else, I just pray that each person be encouraged in their walk with you and their relationship with you. I want to pray for Leanne tonight as she has been transferred from Bangor to Boston. Pray to be the family. I ask that you give the doctor's wisdom and just pray that you would touch her body, that she'd be able to wake up from this ventilator and be able to breathe on her own, and that she would make a full recovery as she is so very young. Pray that you give Jesse opportunity to minister to the family during this time. We think of Miss Juanita as she has talked to the doctors and got this news that there's that there's not a whole lot of hope. And I pray that you might be with her as hope deferred makes the heart faint. And that you would lift her up and protect her with her righteous right hand. And that you would encourage her during this time as she processes this. Lord, I pray that her faith in you would be strong during such a difficult time. Also trust and, and pray that you would be with Amy. We thank you that it was not a more serious injury and it's uh, superficial wounds, but we pray that there would be no infection and that there would be uh, no permanent damage or nerves or tendons or movement, but that she would be able to make a full recovery and be ready to go back and enjoy her summer. We thank you for your hand of protection that was on her and just pray that you might give her a good afternoon, good evening of rest tonight, especially as she gets used to those stitches in there. So Lord, as we turn to James chapter two, I trust that you would continue to be with us as we learn from your word. And as James said in James one, that we would not just be hearers, but that we would be doers as well, and that you would challenge us by your word and that we would leave here changed because we read it and would be able to make the changes that we see necessary. It's in Jesus name I pray, amen. <clears throat> We're gonna be in James chapter two, and uh, I'm going to try something tonight. I have a screen on my right, and I'm going to ask for some feedback, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get it. I've never tried that before, so we're going to try something new, and if not, then we'll just keep going, and I'll read the comments later on. We're in James chapter 2. The question I have for you tonight is, how do you know someone is serious about something? How do you know that someone is serious about something? If I sat here and said, hey, I'm serious about this, how would you know? Would you know because I told you? 
or would you know because I bought something that would lead me to that? So I have some examples. How, so you chime in on the comments and I'll try to, to read some of the comments and try to see if this works out the way I think it will. But the question on the floor or the question on the internet tonight is how do you know if someone is serious about something? How do you know someone is serious about weight loss? <clears throat> they talk about it. Would you think they're serious once they start buying the gym clothes or buying the gym membership or buying the diet bars or exercising more? Would you then take them serious? How about someone that says, I want to start training for a marathon? If I sat here and said, I'm going to start training for a marathon, would you take me serious? Would you know I was serious if I then bought the shoes and bought the, the clothes and if you were driving around Heartland, you'd see me out running. Would you think I was serious about it? I would think I would be serious about it. What about someone with a career choice? We think of opportunities that our graduates have, especially our high school graduates as they lean into college or career, or what are they going to do? And they get serious about it when they start doing internships or start going to colleges for certain studies. You, you know they're serious. How about uh, what about a sports team? You say you love the Boston Red Sox. How do I know that that's true? Well, you might go to games. You might watch the games on TV. You might buy some of the clothing. Uh, you might have a license plate that says go Red Sox or something like that. As we lean into this weekend, it's Memorial Day weekend. Someone says they love their country. How do you know? You know because they served their country. And we're so thankful for our brave men and women. And we remember them this weekend. And we we honor them and we know that they were serious about their love of country because they volunteered to fight and keep our freedoms. So it's the same, it's a whole, do you see the same response through the whole thing is you say something, but then your actions, they follow your belief. And so their actions always follow their statements and they either confirmed them or they denied them. So let me, let me go one more. Uh, if I say I'm in weight, if I'm gonna go on a diet, I'm gonna wait, lose weight and I'm sitting here eating chips and and Snickers bars and Chick-fil-A milkshakes and having Chick-fil-A sandwiches and ice cream and all that. Are you going to take me serious? You're probably not because my actions don't match what I'm saying or my belief system. And that's what we're going to go through tonight. <clears throat> that's what we're going to go through tonight. So we're going to be in James chapter two, verses 14 to 26. And so I'm going to probably go a little bit longer <clears throat> tonight because it's a, I, I want to make sure that I'm crystal clear in what I'm saying. So yeah, if, uh, if you need to pause and come back and get me a little bit later, I understand. But we're going to go here for these 12 verses, and we're going to see what happens, okay? So let's go ahead. Verse, verses 14 to 17. If you're looking to take notes or look in your Bible, I have, I have it entitled, What's the Game? So James is writing, and remember, James is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem that was scattered. And so he's got some things that he needs to address to his congregation. And he writes this. He says, what does it profit? What does it gain you, my brethren? All right. So don't forget, he's writing to his people. He's showing love. He's showing care for them. He wants to challenge them, but he doesn't necessarily want to come across the wrong way as unloving. He wants to show his love for them and ask them this question. He says, so what's it? <clears throat> what does it profit, my brethren? What's it profit, brothers and sisters? If someone says he has faith but does not have works can that faith save him so notice the first thing let's look at john chapter 2 verse 14 what's what's the first thing i noticed the first thing i noticed is someone is saying something hey i'm going to talk about it see here john heichel says once they take action talk is cheap i agree with that so if someone says they speak it i have faith i believe this but they don't have works can that belief, can that faith save them? Well, it goes back to this idea of whatever you want to talk about, of weight loss, of marathon training, of career choice, of your favorite team. If you say something, but your actions don't follow, that's that's what James is going for. And he's not talking about something of weight loss or career or training. He's talking about a faith in the Lord. He's saying, what's it profit? What's it, what's it going to gain you? If someone says that he or she has faith, but then their actions and their life, they don't, they don't match. He says, can that faith save him? Really what he's trying to do is he's trying to get this rhetorical question that's going to get a negative response. Because this guy that's saying this, if someone says he has faith, he, his faith is a faith of profession, not a faith of possession, as one commentator says. I like that. His faith is a faith of profession. He professes it but it's not a faith that he possesses. So he talks about it, but he doesn't own it. 
And so he says, you can have faith, but if it's not shown in your actions, what good is it? It takes us back to James chapter 1, verse 22. We are to be hearers of the word and doers as well. And so it's one thing to sit in here, but we just don't want to sit in here. We need to put action to it. We need to put faith to it. We need to put feet to our faith. So one thing I want to make sure is that I'm crystal clear. When we come to faith in the Lord, we cannot earn God's favor. The faith that we have is a gift from God. And we can't earn that. I would take you to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 really quick. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. What is the gift? It is the gift. Faith is the gift of God, not of works. So we can't earn our salvation because if we earned our salvation, then we could boast. And if we could earn our salvation, then Christ didn't need to come. But if we say we have faith, but yet our works don't reflect that faith or that belief system, then what, how strong is that faith? How strong is that belief system if we're not willing to follow through with it? If we believe the Bible and we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we believe in Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, then our actions will reflect that belief. It, it's that simple and it's that difficult. It's that simple and it's that difficult. Sue so says, He's going to take it in and he's going to give an example in verses 15. He's going to give an object lesson. Don't re- forget, the first century believers, they would be people that didn't have a copy of God's word. I don't know how you're sitting on the other side of the computer screen. I have the verses on my computer highlighted a certain way. I have my Bible app right here with my iPad. I have a, a hard copy of the Bible on my desk. I have Bible Gateway open. We have so many opportunities to have God's word, but James's audience, they didn't have a full copy of God's word. It wasn't fully written yet either. But second of all is they didn't really have the education. They didn't have their reading ability to read it. So someone would read it to them and then they would make illustrations so it was easy to be memorized. So people could walk away going, that was a story. I can understand that and I can go with it. So James is going to give an illustration. He's going to give an object lesson. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food. This is not literally naked, and they're not dying of starvation. But James is saying they don't have the bare necessities of life. They don't have enough clothes to keep them warm. They don't have enough food to really help them to survive. They're barely hanging on on meager bones, uh, beans and rice, rice and beans, if you will, in, in America. So he says, if a brother or sister is naked, if they don't have the basics of life, and one of you says to them, so remember, he's talking to his church. If someone in the church says, depart in peace, be warmed and be filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does that profit? So one commentator says this way, he says, it's like you say to them, God bless you, and God will take care of you, but you don't have any intention of being a channel for that care or that compassion. And so you send them off saying, God will meet you. God will take care of you. Because James says in a previous verse, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? This is a way to demonstrate our faith. So they they can't even see the bare necessities of life. They can't even provide the bare necessities of life. And then we see that need and we send them away. Now, I, I want to pause here. We we look around <clears throat> and we see needs all over. We see physical needs. We see uh, mental needs. We see emotional needs. We see spiritual needs. We see financial needs. Uh, as a pastor, one thing I, I have I have not gotten used to it, but I've understood it now, is in the winter, many people call and because they're they're cold and they don't have enough money to put in their oil tank. And so they call the church and they're asking for help. And my heart of compassion goes out to them. I want to help them. If I was a millionaire or a billionaire, I had all the money in the world, I would fill their tanks. But I can't. I don't have that. So I want to stop and just to speak into this. How do we help those in need? I I want to tell you a biblical story. And then I want to tell you a story I found as I was researching this. If you want to write your Bibles, John chapter five, Jesus is is at the pool of Bethesda or Bethsaida, excuse me. He's at the pool of Bethsaida. And at this pool, it's a whole Bible study in itself. I'm going to take a whole Bible study. I'm going to take it into 
to two minutes or less. Jesus walked into this pool and everyone would be around this pool and an angel would come and stir the water. And the first person that got into the water was healed. And everyone would come around and there wasn't just one person. There was many, many people that were around this pool, hoping that someone would be able to get into the pool to get healed of their illness and then walk away healed. Well, Jesus walked into that pool area and he healed how many people? Well, Bible scholars and you watching, he healed one person. He had to walk around others to heal the one. Now, you might say, I can't help everyone, but you can help one. And if you help one and I help one and someone else watching helps one, looks like we have seven people, six or seven people watching right now. We've just helped six or seven people. And so if we each help one person, we've helped someone. I have an illustration here. I found this. It's a cute story. I want to read it to you. Once on a time, once upon a time, there was an old man who used to go to the ocean to do his writing. He had a habit of walking on the beach every morning before he began his work. Early one morning when he was walking along the shore after a big storm had passed and found the vast beach littered with starfish as far as the eye could see, stretching in both directions. Off in the distance, the old man noticed a small boy approaching. As the boy walked, he paused ever so often. As he grew closer, the man could see that the boy occasionally bent down to pick up an object and he threw it into the sea. The boy came closer and still the man called out, Good morning, may I ask what it is that you are doing? The young boy paused, looked up and replied, throwing starfish back in the ocean. The tide has washed him up onto the beach and they can't return to the sea by themselves. The boy replied, then when the sun gets high, they will die unless I throw them back into the water. The old man replied, but there must be tens of thousands of starfish on this beach. I'm afraid you won't really be able to make much of a difference. The boy bent back down, picked up another starfish and threw it as far as he could into the ocean. And he turned and he smiled and said, it made a difference to that one. And we can make a difference to one person. We can't help everybody. We cannot have the opportunity, the finances to help every single person need, but we can help one. We can really minister to one. And that is an outpouring of our faith. We're to love the Lord with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. What would it look like in, in your life if you were to pause and to help one person that you know in need? It might not be finances. It might be emotionally. It might be spiritually. It might be mentally. It might be physically to minister to them, to minister that one person because it'll make a difference in their life. <clears throat> we don't want to continue to turn people away. We want to help them. <clears throat> we want to be able to reach out with the love of Christ. In verse 17, James says, thus, <clears throat> excuse me, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. See, the speaker has, has the faith that will happen, but his faith without actions, the event won't happen. James chapter 1, verse 27 says, we are to have, this is, this is pure religion, is taking care of the widows and the orphans and remaining clean from the world's influences. See, what, what James is saying here is, thus faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead, it's useless. It's without any life at all. It brings no results. So who's one person that you can reach out to, to help point them to the love of Jesus Christ and minister to them? If you want a second study in your spare time, and take your Bible outside and read, I would challenge you to read through the Gospels and look at how Jesus ministered to the people physically, and then he, he met their needs physically, and then he ministered to them spiritually. I'm thinking of the feeding of the 5,000. He fed them, and then as they ate, he preached. He met many needs physically, and then people were willing to listen to the truth because their immediate needs were met, and then you could speak truth into it. It's a great, great challenge, great challenge from the first three verses of our study tonight. So verses 18 to 25, I've said, uh, show me the evidence. Show me the evidence. James says in verse 18, <clears throat> but someone is, will say, so James doesn't have this combative spirit with him, within him. Someone is not giving him a hard time, but he is thinking of a rhetorical question. We saw this in James chapter 1, verse 13. But someone's going to say, so he's thinking these are arguments that he could possibly foresee from someone in his congregation. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. <clears throat> two different people focus on two different things. One focuses on faith and one focuses on works. Two different attempts 
<clears throat> but both attempts are going to come short because they're focusing on just one part. You need both to come together. He says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Really, what we're looking at is the works are the fruit or the showing of what has occurred or believed in your heart. You think about something that you believe, something that you wholeheartedly believe with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If it's not something of, of Bible-related, it's something else. Think of something that you believe, hook, line, and sinker, the whole thing, you're all in. Then your actions reflect that. They're fruit for that belief. In my life as a pastor, that's what I desire to see from all of my people that I come in contact with. I want people to have this faith, and I want them to be able to show this faith by their hands, by their belief system, and working out and showing that, not as a means of salvation, because we can't earn our salvation, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, but as we show with our hands, it reflects what is in our hearts. The, the works are not the way of salvation, but it's a validation of the salvation that is in your heart. If you tell someone you love them, but you never show them, would they believe it? When I show you I love you, it validates what's coming out of my mouth. It, come, it validates what's coming out because I'm showing you and my walk is matching <clears throat> my talk. James goes in and talks about beliefs. He says, you believe that there is one God. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm sorry, chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This was a basic confession of faith. It still is. God is one God. And he says, you believe that, but really the struggle comes in verse 5. To you hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You are to love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. We focus on what we believe, but verse 5 is the practice or the working out of that belief. He says, you believe that there is one God. You do well. That's good. You should. There are certain biblical doctrines that we need to know in our head. There are certain things that we need to believe. He says, even the demons believe. They believe that there is one God. And they tremble. They shudder. See, the demons believe, but their lives have not been changed or impacted by that belief. Their response is that they shake or quiver out of fear of the Lord but their lives are not changed by their knowledge. The demons believe the right things, but their lives are not changed. Knowing the right things is not saving faith. There is a knowledge of the faith and then a change of life that comes from that knowledge. There's many things I know, but I need to practice them. I need to demonstrate them. An application of that knowledge is showing that the change of life is occurring and it doesn't happen overnight. But once you meet the risen Lord, your life is dramatically different. <clears throat> One thing I was thinking about, if you followed the devotions this morning as I was studying from 2 Kings 22, I, I really saw a good tie in here. Because the people of James's audience, they believed that there was one God, but their actions were, were, not, were not changed. You see, if you go back to 2 Kings 22, our devotions from this morning of Helda, she found the scrolls and the people were acting out of ignorance because they did not have God's law. But as soon as King Josiah got the, the law and he read it, immediately his actions were changed because he had the proper knowledge and then he had the proper belief system and then his hands followed his heart and revival came because they had the right head knowledge and they had the right heart knowledge. So he says, hey, you have the right head knowledge. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. You, but you want to know, oh foolish man, that faith, the knowledge without works coming out in the hands, changing of life, it's dead. So faith includes trust and it includes obedience. So our lives need to be changed based upon how we interact. He's going to go in and talk about Abraham in verses 21 through 23. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? So let's make sure we understand this for you that really study it. And Paul is an author that wrote a lot of the New Testament. 
James is not at odds with Paul on this. They are together. They're looking at this from two different perspectives, but having the same goals. So we're going to see that as we walk through this. Abraham's faith and actions, they work together. Abraham believed God 30 years before this event in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God and it was declared to him as righteousness. So this is not an action where Abraham was saved by his faith. When Abraham offered his son Isaac, he was following in obedience. Why was he able to follow in obedience? Because he had faith in the living God. And so because he had faith, his actions were able to show. <clears throat> Abraham, or James is focusing on Abraham's act of obedience to God's call. He had the faith in God, and then he had the actions to follow, even when it's extremely difficult. I mean, it's always easy to say we trust in God, but yet sometimes it's really difficult to trust in God, especially when we're going through difficult times. And don't forget what James's audience is going through. They're going through extreme persecution. Remember, Stephen was stoned, and they have been scattered. And so he's saying, you need to have your faith, and you need to have the trust, you need to have the obedience, you need to have them both. And he's going back to Abraham and the biggest test that Abraham had to say. If a person doesn't believe in Christ, then they won't do what Christ says because they'll continue to do their own thing because they don't have a belief system that makes them or compels them to follow Christ's commands. One commentator says James is not focusing on the means of salvation, but with the outcome or the evidence that occurred. Hey, Abraham believed, and because he believed, he was able to live in faith, and he was able to demonstrate that faith and able to demonstrate that belief system. <clears throat> Abraham's faith was proven genuine by his desire and his obedience to God's command. <clears throat> One final commentator says Abraham's faith was proven to be a true and living faith, and he was able to prove that faith by his hands or by his works. Verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not faith alone. Not like the demons who merely believe something is true, but a belief that results in actions that reflect those beliefs. I believe things and, and when I believe them wholeheartedly and I take action to it, then I have taken that belief system in my head, I put it in my heart and it's come out of my hands. So that's why I always try to, to teach to the head knowledge. I speak to the heart, and then I challenge with the hands. I speak to the head, I speak to the heart, and I challenge the hands. And that's, we want to be rounded, well-rounded Christians, well-rounded followers of Christ. Because we want to be able to believe and then have our hearts changed, which means our hands are going to change. These good deeds that are we're talking about, they are not to earn a good standing with God but they are to validate or prove faith in God. And those proofs show that we've made a difference in, in our actions. And if you're watching, if you're still with me tonight, 28 minutes in, this, this, works, this works with Christ, but it also works with, with things that are not of the Bible. And so if, if you're here and you're watching and you're not sure of your faith, take, take time reach out to me because I want you to be able to take this step and believe in your head, know facts in your head, but then have a transformation of your heart and then your hands will follow. Rahab, he talks about Rahab. You see that a man is justified by works and not faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot. So why would he go from Abraham, who was a man in the Jewish faith, he was highly esteemed. And then he would also go and he would pick Rahab, who was what? She was a harlot. She was a prostitute. So you are justified by faith from the best to the highest, if you will, in society to those that are not the highest in society. And so Rahab made a confession to God, but then her actions were backed up by her confession by proving that she loved the Lord by hiding the spies. And if you want to go and study that story, that's in Joshua chapter two, where Rahab confessed God had given the Israelites the land and that God, he is the only one true God. So she knew that in her head. And then she demonstrated that belief 
by taking care of the spies and hiding them, letting them out the window down the rope. And so Rahab, she was also justified by works when she received the messengers or spies, and then she sent them out another way. She showed her belief by her actions. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead. So you, James is going back to a physical example, an object lesson. We have a body and we have a soul and a spirit. He says, the body without the spirit is dead. You can't have one without the other. You can't have a dead body and a live spirit. You can't have a live spirit, a live body and a dead spirit. They go together, physically speaking. So faith without works is dead. Faith and works, they go together. It, it's almost physically impossible to separate your body and your spirit. And he says, we cannot separate our faith and our works. We cannot have one without the other. We have faith, which is a belief system. We have works, which shows or validates our belief system. Two more verses, one more verse, excuse me, and then, and then we're going to make an application. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, test yourself to see if you are in faith. Examine yourself. Look at yourself. Take time to reflect. Because the works are the outgrowth of genuine faith. The works that we have are the outgrowth of genuine faith in our life. What we believe, we're going to act upon. What we know is true, we're going to act upon. And so when it comes to the Lord, we need to look at our lives and we need to see, do I have the faith and is that being demonstrated? So the question I have to leave you with tonight is, what faith fruit are you producing in your life? What faith fruit is being produced in your life? You say that you love the Lord, but how, how are you showing that? There is all so many opportunities for us as believers in Jesus to reach out during this time to help people mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, ment uh, other ways, relationally. And we say that we love the Lord and God has made it clear we're to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we're going to go back to that starfish. We might not be able to help everyone but we can help one and make a difference in one's life. What faith fruit are you producing as you look at your life? If there's any way I can help you out, please reach out, let me know. And I would love to have a conversation if you are struggling or if you want to go deeper in any of these subjects, reach out. I hope that you have a great night. I'll see you tomorrow morning for devotions as we continue the who's who in the Old Testament. And then we also have drive-in church. And then the video will also be on Sunday morning around 10 or 10.30 if you don't feel comfortable or can't make it to drive-in church. I will see you on the other side of the computer. Have a great night. And as always, have a good and godly night. Talk to you soon.